Hello and welcome to my channel, Reading Radical Feminism. This is Chapter 4 of Mary Daly's Gynecology. Chapter 4, Chinese Foot Binding, on footnoting the three-inch, quote, lotus hooks, end quote. Quote, if you care for a son, you don't go easy on his studies. If you care for a daughter, you don't go easy on her foot binding, end quote. Chinese saying, Tsai Fei Lu. Begin quote, a woman's heart must be of such a size and no larger, else it must be pressed small like Chinese feet. Her happiness is to be made as cakes are by a fixed receipt, end quote. And then another part of the same epigraph, that was what my father wanted. And that's from George Eliot, Danielle Deronda. Begin quote, the bonsai tree in the attractive pot could have grown 80 feet tall on the side of a mountain till split by lightning, but a gardener carefully pruned it. It is nine inches high with living creatures. One must begin very early to dwarf their growth. The bound feet, the crippled brain, the hair and curlers, the hands you love to touch, end quote. Marge Piercy from A Work of Artifice in To Be Use, To Be of Use. Begin quote. Last week in the bus, I was preoccupied with feet. So many were in sandals, almost squinting at a light they rarely see. One woman's toes, grotesque contortions cramped beneath a brave facade of purple polish. I missed my stop with staring for who could heal such feet, end quote. Robin Morgan from The City of God, Lady of the Beasts. Begin quote. Women, women, limping on the edges of the history of man, crippled for centuries and dragging the heavy emptiness, past submission and sorrow to forgotten and unknown selves. It is time to break and run. End quote. Rita Mae Brown from The New Lost Feminist, In the Hand That Cradles the Rock. The Chinese ritual of foot binding was a thousand year long horror show in which women were grotesquely crippled from very early childhood. As Andrea Dworkin so vividly demonstrates, the hideous three inch long, quote, lotus hooks, which in reality were odiferous, useless stumps. Oh, that's the feet. That's referring to their feet called lotus hooks. Were, huh, were the means by which the Chinese patriarchs saw to it that their girls and women would never run around. So we have a couple of footnotes. Um, Andrea Dworkin talks about this in Woman Hating, and then Lotus Hooks has a footnote. Okay. It is thought-provoking to consider that the symbolism of the lotus in the East is comparable to that of the rose in the West. Like the rose, it is, of course, considered very beautiful, and it is allegedly an unnatural symbol for all forms of evolution. The deception involved in naming the rotted, quote, tiny feet of Chinese women after a beautiful flower is evident. Moreover, the acquisition of, quote, lotuses by the maimed girls meant the end of hope for natural, physical, or mental, quote, evolution. The fact that the, quote, lotuses were frequently named, quote, lotus hooks, end quote, is also suggestive. In fact, the maimed feet did resemble hooks, since the large toe was pointed upward, whereas the others were crushed and bent under the plantar. The Chinese male foot fetishists were, quote, hooked on their perverted practices with the, quote, adorable tiny feet and their female victims were painfully caught on the hook of this ritual, robbed of the normal means of escape running away. Jeez Louise. For further clues concerning connections between the lotus and purity, see Funk and Wagnall's Standard Dictionary of Footlore. The entry on lotus discusses its meaning in China, quote, as elsewhere, it is the emblem of purity because it rises unsullied, however muddied the waters, and does not grow in the earth, end quote. Clearly, the mutilation of Chinese women's feet was intended to keep the victims, quote, pure, that is, the unsullied property of their masters. Like lotuses, these feet could not be planted firmly on the ground, end footnote. 
All of the components of the Sado Ritual Syndrome are illustrated in this atrocity. 1. First, there was the familiar fixation on, quote, purity. In contrast to their counterparts in such countries as India, Chinese males did not have to confine their wives and daughters in Purda in order to protect their, quote, purity, but saw to it instead that their prisoners were hopelessly crippled. The foot purification, really mutilation, ensured that women would be brainwashed as well, since their immobility made them entirely dependent upon males for knowledge of the world outside their houses. Moreover, since torture and mutilation of a small girl was carried out by her mother and other close female relatives, the lesson of, quote, never trust a woman, end quote, was branded upon her soul, and emotional dependency upon the seemingly less involved males was guaranteed. She was not supposed to know that men were the real masterminds of her suffering. Thus, her mind was purely possessed, and it became axiomatic that the possessor of tiny feet was a paradigm of female goodness. 2. The second element of the syndrome, erasure of male responsibility, is evident in foot binding. From the Chinese male's point of view, there was no question of his blame or moral accountability. After all, women, quote, did it to themselves, end quote. One man, cited by Howard S. Levy, described his sister's ordeal as a child when she was forced to, quote, walk with bound feet, begin, quote, Auntie dragged her hobbling along to keep the blood circulating. Sister wept throughout, but mother and auntie didn't pity her in the slightest, saying that if one loved a daughter, one could not love her feet, end quote. Ah. There is a kind of ignorant arrogance in this man's assertion that the older women, the token torturers, felt no pity. According to his own account, they performed this ritual mutilation out of fear that otherwise the girl would not be marriageable. This was a realistic fear, since for a thousand-year period, Chinese males, millions of them, required this maiming of female feet into, quote, lotus hooks, and quote, for their own sadistic, fetishistic, erotic pleasure. One male is quoted by Levy as making the following comment, begin, quote, Every, oh my God. Every time I see a girl suffering the pain of foot binding, I think of the future when the lotuses will be placed on my, huh, on my shoulders or held in my palms and my desire overflows and becomes uncontrollable. End quote. Disgusting pervert. Such male sadism, which dictated the creation of, quote, golden lotuses, end quote, often masked itself as, quote, compassion. Nan Kung Po, a Chinese historical novelist, relates the thoughts of one of his characters upon beholding a courtesan's, quote, tiny feet, begin, quote, he couldn't help feeling compassion for her lower extremities. Compressing the feet in order to thicken the thighs, must have been the invention of a genius. And of course, the inventor must have been a woman, end quote. Yeah, really. Such feelings of, quote, compassion and, quote, pity, which were often described by Chinese men as experienced at the sight of, quote, tiny feet, end quote, contributed to their sadistic pleasure. It did not occur to them, it seems, that they were the agents behind the mutilation, demanding it and enforcing it, deceptively using their mind-bound women to execute their wishes. This, quote, compassion was pure doublethink, pure abnegation of responsibility made plausible by the visibility of women cast into the role of each other's torturers and mutilators. Footnote. This tactic is common enough. In the United States, for example, pimps use their older, tougher prostitutes to beat up young novices. While these trapped women meet out physical punishment, the pimps, like all top dog bureaucrats, play the role of comforting, compassionate godfathers slash, quote, lovers, 
Moreover, we are all familiar with the subtle cultural messages which trick mothers into training their daughters to accept the many physical alterations required for the feminine role. End footnote. Yet another Chinese, quote, genius, who signed himself as, quote, Lotus Nower, so he's a f***ing pervert, blatantly expressed the same self-excusing illogic. Begin, quote, women of antiquity regarded the tiny foot as a crystallization of physical beauty. It was not a product of lewd thinking, end quote. Yet a few lines later, he expresses his own lewd thinking. Begin, quote, The lotus has special seductive characteristics and is an instrument for arousing desire. Who can resist the fascination and bewilderment of playing with and holding in his palms a soft and jade-like hook? End quote. Gross. The exa- well, like, how is that even attractive? I just don't get that. You have to be a f- pervert. The examples can be multiplied. No one was guilty except the girls and women who attempted to disobey or escape. No one was to blame for the evil of maiming women since the reality of evil and maiming was not acknowledged. There were only, quote, beauty and, quote, the extremes of pleasure, end quote. Among the Chinese, foot binding was universally legitimated. Its apologists included philosophers, poets, authors of erotic literature, diplomats, and ordinary, quote, honorable men, end quote. Three, Chinese gynocidal foot maiming, quote, caught on, end quote, rapidly and spread wildly. The brutal right, a family affair, quote, enjoyed by all the members, which scholars say commenced in the period between the Tang and Song dynasties, spread like a cancer throughout China and into Korea. By the 12th century, it was widely accepted as correct fashion among the upper classes. The mothers who belonged to families claiming aristocratic lineage felt forced to bind the feet of their daughters as a sign of upper class distinction. Not to mutilate their daughters was unthinking to them, for it meant that men would find them unattractive and would refuse to marry them. Themselves physically and mentally mutilated, the mothers paradigmatically acted out the role prescribed for them as mutilators of their own kind. Footnote. Older and more skilled concubines were also used to bind the feet of young maids and concubines while their lord enjoyed the painful spectacle. Gross. Gross. That's the end of the footnote. As muted, quote, members of patriarchal society, their imaginations, too, were forced into hierarchical patterns. A mother who, quote, loved her daughter would have upwardly imitative ambitions for her, and the only possible expression of this would be ensuring that she would be made attractive to a suitable husband. Since one requirement for this high status was the possession of, quote, golden lotuses, end quote, this sado ritual spread downward, even to women of the lowest classes in some areas. Four. The use of women as token torturers is more obvious in Chinese foot binding than in Suti. The imprisoned, mutilated women had to believe that, begin, quote, if one loved a daughter, one could not love her feet, end quote. Not only did the contemporary Chinese males choose to see this as something done by women, as if women were truly the controlling agents, but so also do modern Western scholars. Arthur Whaley, for example, in his foreword to Howard Levy's book, writes of his, quote, interest in this, begin, quote, as the most striking example of the strange things that women do or have done to them in almost all cultures in order to make themselves more attractive to men, end quote. There is more. After mentioning that he had been, quote, intrigued, for more than 50 years by such, quote, propensities of women, 
he gives cross-cultural examples. We have a footnote. Among his examples are African women who wear large round discs suspended from their lower lips. It requires no great effort of imagination to think of the usefulness of these discs to the lords and masters of these oppressed women to, quote, keep them in line. Ew. Another example is the elongated necks of some African women. Whaley neglects to mention that husbands punished these, quote, giraffe women, end quote, by removing the neck rings, which Whaley calls, quote, necklaces, supporting their necks, causing excruciating pain. And footnote. Ew. He then gives fraternal praise to the author. Begin quote. One of the values of Mr. Levy's well-documented book on footbinding in China is that it will give material to anyone writing a general anthropological study of such self-mutilations or self-modifications in all parts of the world, end quote. One could ask, did Mr. Whaley read Mr. Levy's book? Did he read there that seven-year-old girls mutilated themselves? What does self mean, that the mothers did it? But it is evident why they were forced to do it. The myth masters and the other males who wielded economic and political power had decided that maimed female feet were essential for male approval and for marriageability. Despite the blatant male-centeredness of this ritual, practitioners of the rights of right scholarship allow themselves to write as if women were its originators, controllers, legitimators. This, of course, is the function of women used as token torturers in Sado rituals, to give plausibility to such deceptive misinterpretations and to perpetuate hate and distrust among women. For the use of female token torturers affects not only the primary victims of the original rituals, the maimed mothers and daughters, who are turned against each other. In addition to this primary level of dividing and conquering women, there are others. Women of, quote, other cultures are deceived by Sado scholarship, which, quote, proves that women like to maim each other, documenting the, quote, fact that, quote, women did it, end quote. This false knowledge fosters female self-loathing and distrust of other women. This deception affects not only the few women who read, quote, primary sources, but also those exposed to derivative resources, such as grade school textbooks, popular magazines like National Geographic, and, quote, educational television programs. Five, the fifth element in the Sado ritual syndrome, ritual orderliness, is illustrated in the thousand-year-long female massacre, Chinese foot binding, which was archetypically obsessive and repetitive. This ritual involved extreme fixation upon minute details in the manufacture and care of, quote, tiny feet. Ugh. There were rules for the size of the bandages, the intervals between applications of tighter and tighter bandages, the roles of various members of the family in this act of dismemberment, the length of the correct, quote, foot, the manner in which the foot-bound woman should sit and stand, the washing of the reformed feet to be done privately because of the smell and ugliness hidden by ointments and fancy shoes. There were also rites of fashion connected with the refashioned feet. Quote, beautiful tiny shoes were designed for various occasions and ceremonies, and the women wore fashionable leggings to hide their monstrously misshapen ankles. 6. All of this horror and dissipation slash misfocusing of energy quickly became accepted as normal and normative, and it remained so for almost a thousand years. Moreover, the complete reversibility of, quote, normality in patriarchy is illustrated in the transition from the footbinding era to the new order of, quote, letting out the feet, end quote. 
discussing the Kuomintang government of the late 1920s, Levy writes, begin, quote, women with bound feet who lived during the transitional era suffered twofold. They endured the pain and discomfort of binding and tender childhood, only to be told in maturity that their sufferings had been in vain because of the demands of the revolution and the change in aesthetic viewpoint, end quote. Thus, the tiny-footed came to be humiliated and looked down upon. We have a footnote. Those, quote, social feminists, end quote, who persist in crediting the Maoist regime with the ending of foot binding are doubly mistaken. First, they are chronologically off base, since by the late 1920s, foot binding was on the wane and, quote, letting out the feet, end quote, was encouraged and often enforced under the Kuomintang. Second, they demonstrate inexcusable ignorance of the intent of the early Chinese revolutionaries to get women into the workforce, as well as of their Maoist successors, from whose perspective the idea of radical feminism is wholly absent. End footnote. Just as the natural footed had formerly been called, quote, unmarriageable, this epithet was now hurled at the possessors of lotus hooks. But for the latter, the natural had now become, quote, normal. One can imagine the situation of a young woman of 20 with perfect three inch, quote, lotuses in which the bones were hopelessly broken and deformed, being told to take off her bindings and walk. The fact was that she could not. She could hobble better in bindings than without them. Those with less, quote, perfect feet, somewhat longer, with the bones unbroken, did in some cases manage to let their feet out. The insensitivity of new masters to the sufferings of these women manifested that this was hardly a gynocentric revolution. The following propaganda song was sung by revolutionaries in the villages to quote recalcitrant tiny footed women who were too maimed to let out their feet. Begin quote, big sister has big feet. See how fast she walks the street. Little sister has tiny feet. With each step, she sways complete. Big sister grows vegetables, tills the field, takes cabbages to market on a carrying pole. Little sister, who can do none of these, washes her bindings, kneeling at the riverbank. Everyone runs away when they smell the stank. End quote. Evidently, males were able to change their aesthetic standards for female beauty when their politics required this. Moreover, women got their cruel and insane orders from all sides, left and right. During the Japanese occupation of Taiwan in the early 20th century, bureaucrats forced women to untie their bindings, often taking an obscene interest in this procedure, and in many cases this had disastrous results. For their extremely abnormal footbound condition had become the closest approximation of normality possible for these crippled victims. 7. The final element of the Sado ritual syndrome, legitimation of the gynocidal ritual by the rights of research, follows a variety of familiar patterns. Indifference, detachment, and minimizing of the sadistic nature of Chinese footbinding are glaringly evident in Whaley's foreword to Levy's book. He writes, begin quote, On the psychological side, this book would have fascinated Havelock Ellis, who in discussing sexual abnormalities stresses the attractiveness to some men of lameness or an uncertain gait in women. There is no doubt that this and other small perversions become institutionalized in the cult of the bound foot in China, end quote. Quote, small perversions, end quote. This expression refers to the torture and crippling of millions of women for the satisfaction of, quote, some men, end quote. These men, as Levy points out and documents, enjoyed squeezing the stumps, or golden lotuses, to the point of causing acute pain, smelling them, whipping them, stuffing them into their mouths, biting them, having their penises rubbed by them. 
These men stole, quote, tiny shoes, and quote, in order to pour semen into them, and drank tea containing the liquid in which the stumps were washed. <laughs> Vomitous. Why are men? Jeez Louise. Oh, it's just a small perversion. We should not imagine that the attraction of, quote, some men to lameness in women is restricted to the Far East. In rationale of the dirty joke, G. Legman, G. Legman, and she says, this really is the author's name, as indicated on the book, Legman. That's funny. <laughs> oh, God. Writes, begin, quote, a woman had lost a leg mm, during World War II and had to wear an artificial limb, with the unexpected result that perverted men began following her in the subway and whispering sexual invitations to her, end quote. Moreover, William A. Rossi, who thoroughly approves of foot fetishism, points out that, quote, female helplessness arouses many men, end quote, alluding to the fact that one extreme example, ankle bondage, goes back at least 4,000 years. Clearly, Whaley is aware of this widespread fixation, for he himself, in his pure scholarly way, participates in it. He is, quote, interested in women's mutilation and knows that Havelock Ellis would have been, quote, fascinated. Moreover, the fact that Levy allowed this foreword to be published in his book, a foreword that completely negates the realities so explicitly exposed in the book, suggests that the author either concurs in its erasure or does not notice it. All of this boils down to about the same thing. Double think and detachment from women's oppression. This double think is of a piece with that of the Chinese males who were moved to quote compassion at the sight of the tiny feet, which was a condition for sexual arousal. Can't see it, but I'm shaking my damn head. Ooh, conventional scholarship contributes mightily to the, quote, normalizing of the atrocious ritual in people's minds after the fact, perpetuating and extending its mind-binding influence. This is accomplished repeatedly through the use of language that minimizes slash belittles facts. Thus, the very title of Levy's book puts footbinding in its place, uh, Chinese foot binding, the history of a curious erotic custom. We have a footnote, of course. Nevertheless, this is a well-documented and horrifyingly well-illustrated book. Mm. A fact no doubt due in large measure to the help of Levy's wife, Henrietta Liu Levy, who is credited in the acknowledgments with giving, begin quote, invaluable assistance, aiding me in reading and clearing up problem areas with a minimum of wasted time. End quote and footnote. The adjective curious suggests the bland detachment of schizoid scholarship. The adjective erotic is deceptively innocuous sounding for it fails to convey the fact that sexual desire is aroused precisely by mutilation. I have already discussed the lie that is embedded in the term custom, which suggests something as physically harmless as a handshake or the table manners of Emily Post. Another normalizer is Rossi, who, writing in the United States in 1976, finds it possible to describe foot binding as, begin, quote, one of the most powerfully persuasive examples of the foot's natural eroticism, end quote. The reversal is obvious. Rossi's work is a veritable source book for a study of legitimation of Sado ritual by the rights of research. It is full of examples whose grotesqueness would have to be rated as above average. The author asserts that the view of the quote outside world end quote which judged this thousand year long quote sex orgy end quote involving five billion Chinese his estimate as barbarous and cruel has been quote naive and distorted end quote. By way of elucidation, he explains 
that, quote, the Chinese regarded the bound foot as the most erotic and desired portion of the entire female anatomy, end quote. The use of the term Chinese here is pseudogeneric, for it was men who desired this portion of the mutilated female anatomy. Women desiring to survive were conditioned to believe that this maiming was essential to please the patriarchs. Rossi's deceptive use of pseudogenerics is even more blatant in his assertion that, quote, the human species prefers itself a little bent out of natural shape, end quote. The statement, of course, veils the fact that men prefer women to be bent badly, quote, out of shape, end quote, on all levels, physical, mental, and spiritual. Rossi describes the Chinese semi-amputees as, quote, a reigning clan of goddesses with sensual powers not bestowed upon ordinary women, end quote. By now, it is evident to the reader what sort of, quote, powers these, quote, reigning goddesses enjoyed. Rossi prefers not to know. When he uses the term cruel to describe the practice of foot binding, it is in quotation marks. Instead of using the term pain, he writes blandly of, quote, discomfort, to which, quote, the growing girl developed a good deal of immunity, end quote. Footnote, it is fascinating to discover that the same author many years ago published a book entitled Your Feet and Their Care. In this earlier tome, Rossi had written, begin quote, someone coined the expression, inner quote, when your feet hurt, you hurt all over, end inner quote. Every foot sufferer will vouch for the truth of that statement. Abe Lincoln, who wore a 14B shoe and suffered greatly with his feet, <laughs> said more than once in her quote, I cannot think if my feet hurt me, and in her quote, he had a private chiropodist who attended to his feet regularly. We have another quote without the end of the quote. An aching foot can distress your whole being, put a raw edge on your disposition, annihilate your peace of mind, cause nausea, dissipate your vigor. If the foot ill becomes serious and chronic, its gnawing persistence can produce sharp changes in your whole personality, harmfully affect posture, poise, and carriage, end quote. So when men have hurt feet, it affects their whole life and their minds. And when women have hurt feet, it's cute. End footnote. The unsuspecting reader of his book may be seduced into associating foot binding with something like the adolescent discomfort of wearing braces on one's teeth. Perhaps she is even lulled by the arrogant style of authority in forgetting to ask the most obvious questions, such as, just how would he know? Thus, she may nod in mesmerized agreement when he intones the familiar misinformation, begin quote, Women have always had an affinity for fragile foundations and willowy walking, end quote. <sighs> Anyone who thinks of contemporary Western stylish women's shoes and of the indoctrination women all receive from earliest childhood about the, quote, correctness of such footwear knows something about this, quote, affinity and its origins. We have all heard the familiar derisive remarks about, quote, women who wear sensible shoes, end quote. The term sensible, meaning reasonable, is used as derogatory when applied to women's choice of footwear. An implication of this is that women should not be sensible slash reasonable because this is desexualizing in men's eyes. The connection between the condition of one's feet and the state of one's mind is implied by this adjective sensible. Hobbling on spiked heels or platform shoes, painfully smiling, women feel physically and emotionally unsteady. In such attire, they are vulnerable physically since it is at least difficult, if not impossible, to run from an attacker or participate in many ordinary, not to mention athletic, activities. They are also vulnerable mentally slash emotionally, since such footwear keeps them aware, at least subliminally, of their victim status. Mm. Their response to this awareness is to send out signals of helplessness through tones of voice, nervous laughter, body language, and self-deprecating speech and behavior. 
footnote. In reconsidering the pejorative attack on, quote, sensible shoes, end quote, it may also be enlightening to consider another definition of the term sensible. Begin, quote, capable of receiving impressions from external objects through the sense organs, end quote. Feet are our contact with the ground, the earth. Spinsters undertaking a dangerous and adventurous journey need to be balanced and sure-footed and capable of receiving impressions accurately. We therefore choose our equipment wisely, and this means choosing sensible shoes. To succumb to the dictates of foot, quote, fashion, fascist, is to fail to break away from sado ritual behavior. Such behavior creates the familiar, quote, living proof, end quote, which supports mendacious assertions by the scholars of Sado ritual, such as Rossi, about women's, quote, affinities, end footnote. Another muddied approach to foot fetishism is to be found in Ernest Becker's The Denial of Death. Becker, who argues that sadomasochism is, quote, natural, sees the foot as, quote, the absolute and unmitigated testimonial to our degraded animality, to the incongruity between our proud, rich, lively, infinitely transcendent, free inner spirit and our earthbound body, end quote. This combination of flesh loathing and false transcendence is developed further in the same paragraph when he states that, quote, nothing equals the foot for ugliness or the shoe for contrast and cultural contrivance, end quote. After reading this, it is not too surprising to find the same author affirm that the practice of Chinese foot binding represents, begin, quote, the perfect triumph of cultural contrivance over the animal foot, exactly what the fetishist achieves with the shoe, end quote. Thus, the, quote, infinitely transcendent, free inner spirit, end quote, and, quote, cultural contrivance, end quote, are clearly identified with the male, while the, quote, ugly animal foot, end quote, over which the latter triumphs, is the female. The mutilated female foot, then, is a triumph of patriarchal transcendence. Becker hardly seems to know what he is saying or how he unmasks patriarchal values. He goes on, begin, quote, One of the reasons that the fetish object is itself so splendid and fascinating to the fetishist must be that he transfers to it the awesomeness of the other human presence. The fetish is then the manageable miracle, while the partner is not, end quote. Becker fails to make explicit the fact that, quote, the other human presence, unquote, which the threatened male finds so awesome that he must reduce it to manageability is female. Also lacking is any recognition of the perversion involved in seeing the natural female foot as ugly and its mutilated substitute as, quote, splendid. But then this is consistent with Becker's belief that sadomasochism is, quote, natural. Another sterling example of Sado scholarship legitimating Chinese foot binding is R. H. Van Gulick's Sexual Life in Ancient China. Why are men writing these stupid books anyway? Van Gulick dismisses as, quote, far-fetched the explanation that Confucianists encouraged the, quote, custom because it restricted women's movements and kept them in the house. He misses the point that the explanation in terms of restriction of women's movements is not, quote, far-fetched, but rather that it does not go far enough. Van Gillick dismisses foot binding as having something or other to do with, quote, shoe fetishism, but fails to see it as oppressive, despite the fact that he himself presents a truly horrifying drawing of a bound foot based on an x-ray. Following the usual pattern of doublethink, he is unable to see slash name the significance of his own observation that, quote, women's small feet came to be considered as the most intimate part of her body, the very symbol of femininity and the most powerful center of sex appeal, end quote. 
failing to acknowledge that the mutilation slash muting of women into quote femininity was slash is sadism on the scale of massacre, he culpably misses the point of his own observation that the bandages were taken off only in seclusion when they were changed after the bath. The point is, of course, that public exposure would destroy the illusion promoted by the euphemistic ritual of, quote, tiny feet, end quote. The blatancy of Van Gillick's detachment is illustrated in the following statement, begin, quote, As to the detrimental effects on women's health caused by foot binding, these are often exaggerated. Mm, bet you think that. For the general state of health of Chinese women, the secondary effects of foot binding were the most serious. Bound feet discouraged women's interest in dancing, fencing, and other physical exercises popular with the weaker sex in foot binding days. End quote. This is comparable to describing a leg amputation as, quote, discouraging figure skating, skiing, or ballet. One difference between foot-bound women and amputees is that the latter can, with prostheses, learn to walk, whereas perfectly foot-bound women could only fall from stump to stump and often had to be carried. Our author does seem to overcome his detachment enough to feel one serious regret, however. Begin quote, In the artistic field, Foot binding had the regrettable consequence that it put a stop to the great old Chinese art of dancing. After the Sung period, one hears less and less about great dancers, end quote. Mm. Indeed. And here the irony of the Sado ritual procession has come full circle. For the legend that had been employed to, quote, explain, legitimate, and encourage the ritual tells that the emperor Li Yu had a favored palace concubine named Lovely Maiden, who was a gifted dancer. He ordered her to bind her feet and dance in the center of a six-foot-high lotus constructed for this purpose. Quote, she then danced in the center of the lotus, whirling about like a rising cloud, end quote. This, quote, event was used to trick women into identifying beauty and dancing with bound feet. Clearly, no contradiction is too blatant to qualify as a Sado ritual legitimation. Indeed, the more blatant the contradiction slash reversal, the more effective it seems to be as a mind poisoner. This is an essential characteristic of Sado ritual scholarship as well as myth. Also, I just want to quote as reader that dancing i mean men make that so sexual he's like mad that their sexualizing of feet has kept them from sexualizing dancing and gross just perverts that's and my comment all right van gillick finally provides an illuminating example of scholarly hypocrisy about scholarly hypocrisy slapping the wrist of a 19th century scholar who proclaimed that the minds and bodies of chinese quote people are distorted and deformed by unnatural usages begin quote that observer conveniently forgot that at the same time his wife and female relatives at home were bringing upon themselves cardiac, pulmonary, and other serious afflictions by the excessive tight lacing of their waists. <laughs> Foot binding caused much pain and acute suffering, but women of all times and races have, as a rule, gladly borne those if fashion demanded it, end quote. Yeah, right. With his magic wand, the scholar brands all women as agents of their own affliction. The first agent supposedly, quote, demanding, this is, quote, fashion. In this fascinating example of learned doublethink, we find a right-thinking scholar conveniently using the universal oppression of women by patriarchal fashion designers as a weapon to chastise a member of the scholarly brotherhood. The latter came close to non-observance of the rules by becoming too critical of the Chinese, quote, custom.
It is undoubtedly true, as Van Gillick insinuates, that the criticized scholar was a cultural chauvinist. Nevertheless, he had inadvertently taken a step too far in the direction of searching, rather than rightfully, R-I-T-E-F-U-L-L-Y, rightfully recovering. Mm. Consequently, the right thinking Van Gillick had to brand him as exemplifying, quote, the smug attitude of 19th century Western observers, end quote. There are also more subtle slash refined manifestations of scholarly mystification. In the case of Chinese foot binding, as in the case of Indian sooty, Vern Bullock provides examples of language which fails to move the reader, who then becomes a victim of, quote, syntactic exploitation. Hmm. Thus, he describes foot binding as, quote, a practice which made it almost impossible for women to move about without great effort, end quote. The combination of the verb almost with the phrase without great effort has a completely nullifying effect. Each erases the point of the other. Had he eliminated either the adverb or the phrase, the statement would have been correct. Had he eliminated both, it still would have been accurate. By the use of both, he succeeds in watering down the reality to the point that the statement is simply wrong. For foot binding did indeed make it impossible for women to move about without great effort and without great agony. His choice of the bland term effort is deeply and subtly deceptive. If it conjures up any images at all, these are somewhere in the range of tight shoes, corns, bunions, or at worst a sprained ankle, hardly conveying the reduction of a woman's feet to putrescent three-inch stumps. Bullock deceives by omission. He nowhere describes the horrible physical reality of foot binding, although he uses the same source, Howard S. Levy, as Andrea Dworkin, and therefore had available for use the very same graphic and detailed material. His terse statement that, quote, there was a cult of foot fetishism, end quote, conveys nothing of the maiming of women. Rather, he fulfills the expectation of Arthur Whaley that Levy's book, quote, will give material to anyone writing a general anthropological study, end quote. Indeed, this is the ritual of research. Each book, quote, gives material, end quote, for another. The more, quote, general, the better. That is to say, the more blandly that it blends the, quote, material, universalizing it all into vague abstractions, such as, quote, customs, the safer, the better, the more scholarly. All that is missing is life slash spirit slash spinning process. In contrast to the luminaries cited above, Andrea Dworkin, who uses Levy as her source, has written of footbinding with passion, with integrity of knowing and feeling, with feminist consciousness. As a result, she shocks the reader into awareness, helping her to understand holistically, that is using mind slash imagination slash emotions, the significance of the facts of foot binding and their interconnections with other facts, such as contemporary American destruction of women in the name of, quote, romantic love. Her book title, Woman Hating, and her chapter title, Gynocide, Chinese Foot Binding, quickly sweep the, quote, material off musty library shelves reserved for those who are, quote, curious about remote, quote, erotic customs, end quote. The facts come alive, for the feminist author has no hidden agenda of hiding the horrors. Quite the contrary is the case. She deliberately unmasks them, showing the interconnectedness between this and other gynocidal practices and propaganda. Thus, Dworkin helps the reader to know, sense, become incensed, catching an essential thread of meaning in this, quote, curious erotic custom, end quote. She shows it to the reader, begin quote, it, that is foot binding, demonstrates that man's love for woman, his sexual adoration of her, his human definition of her, require her negation, physical crippling, and psychological lobotomy.
brutality, sadism, and oppression emerge as the substantive core of the romantic ethos, end quote. Now we're on to something. Dworkin's work has received the usual, quote, silent treatment, end quote, meted out to those who name atrocities and point out their interconnectedness. There has also been criticism of her lack of scholarship. This could only be justified if the same criteria were universally applied rather than selectively used as an excuse for dismissing feminists, and if her book had been intended primarily as a work of conventional scholarship. Unlike male social critics such as Marshall McLuhan, for example, who regards his books as, quote, probes, her work has been judged without generosity or justice, dismissed without adequate cause. Yet women continue to be awakened by it because it breaks away from the rituals and makes thinking come alive. Thinking that is alive involves seeing connections between seemingly different phenomena, for example, between fairy tales and gynocidal history. Crone logical thinkers, then, will not be surprised to read in Funk and Wagnall's Dictionary of Folklore that the tale of Cinderella is originally an oriental story. Indeed, begin, quote, the earliest known version happens to be Chinese from the 9th century AD, end quote. In the light of the history of footbinding, this isolated piece of information ominously, quote, makes sense, end quote. Upon further reflection, the picture becomes more ominous. Hundreds of millions of children, quote, know the story of Cinderella. Most of us received it from the Brothers Grimm in a rather refined and adulterated form. Nevertheless, we learn from it, or we're supposed to learn, several important lessons, that tiny feet are essential to female beauty, that stepmothers read mothers are cruel, that the ultimate female tragedy is not to be married. In order to realize the full implications of the grim tale of Cinderella, however, it is helpful to look at earlier versions, which are less delicate. One version recounted by Jakob Ludwig Karl Grimm. So is he not a Grimm brother? Just named Grimm? In the early 19th century, republished and translated in subsequent editions as recently as 1975, has it that when the eldest sister unsuccessfully tried to fit her foot into the tiny golden slipper provided by the prince, her mother ordered her to cut off her big toe to make it fit. At first, the prince was fooled, but the flow of blood made him aware that he had been tricked. Then the stepmother had off, ugh, had her other daughter cut off a slice of her heel to get it into the shoe, but she had the same bloody problem. Then, of course, Cinderella tried it on and it fit her tiny foot. The reader of this book will recall the account of the Chinese mother and aunt who said, that if one loved a daughter, one could not love her feet. This, however, is no oriental peculiarity. It is an idea legitimated not only in the obscure tomes and scholarly journals of specialists in, quote, curious erotic customs, end quote, but in the, quote, charming fairy tales we heard as bedtime stories from pre-kindergarten learning through graduate school, quote, education, Female foot maiming and mind maiming is recovered, researched, rehearsed. The literature from the Brothers Grimm tale to Van Gulick's opinionated prose functions to perpetuate the right, to promote the right, R I G H T, thinking, above all to prevent women from putting the pieces together and running slash dancing free. And that is the end of chapter four. If you like this reading, please like and subscribe. If you haven't listened to previous chapters, I highly recommend this book. And I will be back soon with chapter five. Thanks for listening.